Uh, hello and welcome to this episode of the Millis podcast, a show about ideas, books and events from the Christian intellectual scene in Australia and beyond. I'm your host, Simon Kennedy. I'm the director of the Millis Institute here at Christian Heritage College. I'm also a senior lecturer in humanities. Um, and I'm also a research fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of Queensland. And I'm excited to be joined today by Dr. Stephen Shavira, who is an independent scholar, author, of, uh, author and co-author of several books, including Tudor Protestant Political Thought, 1547 to 1603 with Brill, Reason, Religion and the Australian Polity, A Secular State with a question mark at the end, very important question mark with Rutledge. And most recently has co-authored a very fine monograph with uh, Gregory, Gregory Meliush entitled The Forgotten Menzies, the world picture of Australia's longest serving prime minister with Melbourne University Press. Steve is a lecturer in history at Campion College in Sydney, and he's also a well-known social and political commentator. And I am honoured to call him my friend as well. So, Steve, it's great to have you on. Thanks for coming. Um, I want to talk mainly about this book, uh, the book, your latest book on Menzies. Um, Steve, could you start off by um, telling us why uh, you thought there needed to be another book on Menzies? Menzies is well known. He's both well loved and well hated. What kind of uh, what what kind of things were were driving you and and Greg to write this book? Well, it's great to be on the show, Simon. Um, the book, in in a sense, was a, a kind of um, happy accident yeah, because we never sort of set out to write a book on Menzies, Greg and Greg and I. Greg um, Eluish was working on a, um, a a big project on the history of conservative thought in Australia, and uh, along the way, we we uh, we um, published a couple of things on the history of conservative thought in Australia, and then I started diving deep into the archives of Menzies to just look into his thinking. And what uh, both Greg and I discovered is that um, not only are the, are the archives of Menzies at the National Library in Australia incredibly extensive, there are hundreds and mm. hundreds of boxes, mm. but in fact, uh, Menzies himself was quite an interesting thinker, uh, which isn't to say that he was, he was necessarily a great thinker, yeah. but he, he, he certainly liked to put everything in, into a sort of big picture view. Mm. And, and so in that sense, he was interesting. He kind of imbibed and expressed uh, very common ideas at the time that were, that were sort of common philosophical ideas about uh, the relationship between uh, prosperity, technology and, yep. and, and society and, and that kind of thing. But look, the, the bottom line is we discovered that in actual fact, um, there's a lot to be written on Menzies, but the actual book in a sense came from... Um, a sort of splicing together of my my previous research into secularism in Australia and mm. and and Robert Menzies because uh, reading on the history of secularism in Australia and in Britain I, I noticed historians <clears throat> kept using this term cultural puritanism yeah. and 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 sort of the the path of secularization in in, in Great Britain was. Uh, often described in terms of the death of cultural puritanism in England. And I thought, well, that's interesting, cultural puritanism. Because, yeah. of course, Simon, as you know, when you think of yeah. puritanism, you'll tend to think of the Elizabethan uh, Puritans like Thomas right. Cartwright. And then you'll think that's of right. the early um, uh, uh, refugees to America. That's right. Uh, but you tend not to war, think of it. Civil war in England and so on. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, the civil war in England. But you tend not to think of it in terms of sort of 19th century um, no, that's right. British society. Yeah. And, and anyhow, I got reading this literature on cultural puritanism. And what struck me was that how many of its tropes like sturdiness, mm. um, um, sort of the, the, the ideal of, of the of independence, yeah. uh, the Scotsman, and yeah. that how it actually really resembled what I was reading at the time also in Robert Menzies, particularly his Forgotten People speech. And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, mm. I've never noticed it before but what robert menzies is actually describing in terms of the you know these ideals that he's afraid that australia is losing is what historians were calling cultural right. puritanism right right and no one had really made that argument before i mean people had, had spoken broadly about menzies and protestantism so judith brett's uh, had written broadly and very very well about that but narrowing it down to a particular expression of Protestantism, cultural Puritanism had not been done. And so I looked more into the literature of cultural Puritanism, more into the literature of Menzies, more into the newspapers and things that 
Mm. I discovered around the time of Menzies and, and realized that in actual fact, this cultural puritanism had been very influential in Australia. Right. And so Greg and I wrote an article and that, that just turned into a book. And so it was kind of just one of those things where in, in a sense, the, the research led us on. We, we were really were following the research. It was, it was actually a wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's, that's perfect as, as people who work in intellectual history and history of ideas. That's sort of what you want. You don't want to go... You don't want to start with a preconceived idea and go and find that. Uh, as you said, the research led you on, which is great. Yeah. Um, and, and look, my next question, I guess, is, is, re- is related to that one in a sense, because you say in the book that rather than um, assessing Menzies by contemporary political ideologies and categories, uh, you say, quote, it's far more useful to consider the cultural patterns of Greater Britain um, than to consider Menzies in terms of supposedly universal political ideologies um i guess this is a two-part question one is uh, is that typically how people and particularly historic australian political historians have analyzed menzies up to this point and then i'm, I'm interested in what those co- british cultural patterns are or whether mm. you can expand on on that uh well yeah recently uh, in debates on the the identity of the liberal party in mm. australia over the last five years uh because as you know the liberal party is is really plagued by factions mm. and so the big question is you know who who are who are we as liberals mm. and naturally they're going back to the the foundations of the party and especially to the thought of robert menzies and and so you, you had people like malcolm turnbull who were sort of on the the left or the progressive wing of the liberals sort of saying well no uh, menzies was a progressive he he, yeah. he 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 described the party as progressive and but you've also sort of had uh, those who have said, well, you know, no, he's not progressive, he's conservative. Mm. Um, and, and I thought to my, or, or you know, uh, he, he's a, or he's a liberal or a conservative mm. liberal. And there's a sense in which uh, all of those labels could be applied to him. But the problem right. was people were defining the labels in what we might call anachronistic yeah. uh, ways that yeah. they were sort of, what does it mean to be a modern progressive? Well, a modern progressive is someone who would have been in favor of same sex marriage, someone who'd be really um, enthusiastic about fighting climate change. Um, Tim Wilson recently, I believe, wrote a book where he argued that if Menzies were around today, he'd have, he'd have voted in favor of same sex marriage. Of I've course. heard that secondhand, but of course, <laughs> um, but um, but, and, and you know, when people think of the term liberalism and conservatism, often what they do is they'll, to define it, they'll go to a, you know, you, you know Haywood, the textbook on politi- yeah. political ideologies and look for the definition. Oh, okay, you know, liberalism, an emphasis on individual rights, often an emphasis on a free, on a free economy and that kind of thing. And, and well, that's what Menzies was. But yeah. in fact, what, what, we, what we found was that in a sense, yeah, Menzies certainly, dis- certainly can be described as a liberal, as a conservative, and even to some extent as a progressive, if you like, even though I, I don't like that term. But the, but the meanings of those words needed to be understood in the context of the time. Yes. Um, so for example, I mean, to, to give an example, a modern day liberal, if someone said, well, I'm, I'm a liberal, Mm. They would believe in fairly liberal marriage laws that that, that allowed people to get no fault divorce. Yes, but it'd be a, a, a serious problem to retroject that view, say back on the nineteenth century, onto say John Stuart Mill, the quintessential mm. liberal, because in his book on liberty, he writes against unilateral easy uh, uh, divorce laws right. because he right. thinks it'll be socially harmful. So to understand the liberalism of Mill and, and of Menzies, you've got to understand the milieu of the time. And mm. as I was saying earlier, Simon. The milieu that Menzies grew up in was strongly British, but it was mm. also intellectually speaking, particularly the Melbourne scene, very strongly influenced by, as I said earlier, cultural puritanism, which, which was not about individualism in, in the sort of atomistic sense of, 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 of an obsession with individual rights, uh, but, but it focused on individuality. That is right. uh, individuals sort of realizing their full potential as members of a community being self-reliant but also having the means to be able to help others it was it was and it was strongly influenced not just by by christianity but also by a philosophical school of thought at the time known as idealism Mm, very Mm. interesting this is this is interesting to me because i've just finished reading a big um biography of winston churchill and then i read your book on Robert Menzies and Menzies was obviously a long serving prime minister, fifties and forties, fifties and sixties. And Churchill, Churchill's hot, um, 
era is a similar one, although he, he kind of peaked earlier, I guess, than, than Menzies did. But there's something analogous about the way that Menzies and Churchill thought about the world, it seems to me, and also the role of Britishness and Englishness and so on. Um, you talked about British cultural patterns um, in, your, in your book. What, what kind of British, specifically British cultural patterns do you have in mind? And, 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 and yeah. I mean, part of that might be cultural Puritanism. Part of it yeah. might be this Melbourne idealism that you raise as well. Do you want to explain? Yeah, that? well, it, it is partly cultural Puritanism. It is partly um, what's often called British idealism. Mm. Um, uh, the, the thought, the, the influence of the thought of, of Oxford philosopher T.H. Green, who was influenced mm. by Hegel and, and a kind of Re, uh, a kind of philosophical response to utilitarianism at the time and 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 Menzies himself from his very earliest essays that he wrote for the Melbourne <clears throat> University magazine in 1916 mm. sort of spoke a, a, against the utilitarian spirit which he kind of thought was a bit dehumanizing overly pragmatic and forgot about things like spirit and ideals and things like that but also in a sense the centrality and, and this is the big thing really um, the centrality of the British Empire to the well-being of the world yeah, and and certainly, you know, by the 1950s, um, Menzies recognizes uh, probably by the end of the 1940s, Menzies recognizes that the empire, that things are just never going to be the same again after World War II, and and pretty soon after World War II, obviously you have the decolonization yeah. movement, you have the rise of the United Nations, yeah. and so the the idea of the British Empire by the by the 1950s is quaint, but mm -hmm. but certainly sort of the, the the notion of the British Empire. And a, a kind of family of countries, uh, not necessarily bound by laws and, and treatises mm. uh, and treaties like the United Nations, but bound by a kind of familial friendship and love. Right. Uh, now, whether that's actually how things ever were yeah, is, yeah. Is, is in a sense beside yeah. the point, but that's how Menzies saw things. Yeah. yeah. And, and, that, and, and so the centrality of empire to Australia's identity and also to the... I suppose that the future well-being of the world mm. were, were definitely sort of British patterns of thought that, that influenced Menzies certainly yeah. right up uh, to the 1950s. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 when you, and when you speak of cultural Puritanism in the book, you describe certain things like, it, it, in a way, it is a sort of Scot, uh, pr almost a, not, a Protestant work ethic not quite the right way of putting it. I have issues with that, that idea, but there's something to that in the sense that it's, it's hard work, it's the centrality of the family, it's small business, mm. it's um, self, self-reliance. And this, that's this kind of cultural Puritanism. Is that, is, that, is that what you have in mind? Is it more than that as well? Well, it's to be distinguished from often sort of caricatures of, mm. of the Protestant spirit, which, which basically say, you know, uh, work hard, um, yeah. accumulate money. Yeah. And, and, and basically look after yourself. And if everyone does that, then everything will basically yeah. turn out okay. Yeah. Um, for, for Menzies, it, it wasn't quite like that. It, it, um, th th there, was a, there was a great emphasis throughout his thoughts on, on things like um, scrutinizing yourself. And so he, yeah. he, 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 he imports these Puritan tropes into his thinking about Australia. He very often tells Australians, you know, we need to, we need to look inside ourselves. We need to scrutinize yeah. ourselves. We need to look for selfishness and things like yes. that. Very, very uh, Puritan. Yeah. But, but also, uh, again, you know, the, the, the Protestant work ethic tends historically to say nothing about our duties to other people. It's, it's right. really just about working hard so you don't have to rely on anyone else. Because I think one of the Menzies. things you draw out is that Menzies was very civic minded and he thought mm. that was actually, that should be a marker of an Australian way. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, we remember that the Puritans started sort of communities. They started religious communities where people were very, very much interconnected. And, and for Menzies, yes, you, you want to work hard and you want to not, and you don't want to work hard so you can become rich. You want to work hard so that you become a lifter that you can, and, and not a leaner, as he famously said, that, that you don't have to rely on other people. And, and certainly so you don't have to rely on the state. But the second half of that for Menzies is, you know, you want to be thrifty, you want to work hard so, so you can be independent enough to be able to do your bit for the community right. and to help others when they need help. Yeah. And the other thing about Menzies was that he was quite opposed to laissez-faire capitalism. He, he, he believed mm. quite strongly that um, society, and, and this is sort of a quote from Menzies, should not just be a kind of fighting ring where people go in and fight 
to survive, which as far as he was concerned, that's what laissez-faire free market capitalism is. No, he, he thought that you, you want capitalism, but you also need the state involved to, in a sense, to civilize it and to ensure that everyone gets what we would today call a fair go, which was very much in line with the kind of liberalism of the of the Victorian, and by Victoria, I mean the Australian state and colony Victoria, mm. uh, of, the, of the sort of Deaconite position. So the, the cultural Puritanism uh, comes out in his rhetoric of, of independence and not individualism, and also that emphasis on being, yeah, as you said, Simon, being very civic minded and, and you know, loving your neighbor as yourself mm. and, and those kinds of things. So in, in that respect, um, uh, for Menzies, the, the, the sort of the, 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 the idea that, well, our duties are simply not to harm one another. Right. Menzies just thought, no, that there's far more to it than that. Yeah. And, and to express all of this, you often use sort of biblical tropes, uh, cited the Apostle Paul and things like that. Yes. I, I want to come to the impact that Christianity had on Menzies and also what kind of Christian Menzies was in a minute. Um, but an, an aspect which was, I think, really intriguing in your book was Menzies' um, affiliation with Melbourne idealism. Now, you've touched on this really briefly when you were talking about, you mentioned things like the, the, the ideas of T.H. Green and the emphasis on human spirit and so on. But I'd just like to drill down a little bit more on that because this is actually a relatively foreign kind of way of thinking, I think, for us today. Mm. Um, but for Menzies, this was uh, underlying much. It seems I think you've proven quite, quite decisively that this underlies much of what he was on about. Um, so how how would you can you go a little bit further yeah. in explaining this um, idealism, but particularly um, the background of Melbourne idealism, because yeah. of course, um, Menzies went to Melbourne university. Yes. He, he was a Melbourne, uh, he was a member of parliament uh, in a Melbourne electorate. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, again, the philosophical theory of idealism often called, sort of called British idealism, sometimes called social liberalism, it's sort of its most famous protagonist was the Oxford professor T. H. Green, and and the basic idea behind it was that there is more to being a human being right. than just a being that can feel pleasure and pain. Yeah, and in that respect, it was a kind of re response to uh, fairly crude forms of utilitarianism in yep. the nineteenth century, which, which basically said all the law needs to worry about, all morality needs to worry about, is ensuring that people experience as much pleasure or happiness uh, in mm -hmm. their lives and avoid as much pain as possible. And also with idea with um, utilitarianism, it tended to, to be very, very much in favor. It was almost getting quite libertarian, yeah. um, wh whereby just leave people alone and, and things will probably work out for the, for the best for everyone. And, and Menzies and, and many and, and idealist philosophers at the time in Australia, particularly at Melbourne University, and for a time at Sydney University with uh, Francis Anderson, who mm. eventually was replaced by John Anderson, mm. um, the famous philosopher, not the statesman. Yes. Um, particularly in Melbourne, and exactly why, I suppose we're not entirely sure. No. No. Um, but this, this, this anti-utilitarian idealism uh, philosophy, which emphasized, you know, what's the meaning of life? Well, in a sense, realizing your personality. Um, this took great hold in the whole sort of Melbourne intellectual scene. There, there were dissidents from it, but it was incredibly powerful in the whole Melbourne intellectual scene right up till World War II. And... And Menzies, you know, Menzies mind was formed in this Melbourne scene. And so consequently, a lot of the tropes and words that you would hear with idealism, like things like um, critiquing utilitarianism, uh, the importance of, of sort of, of not just pleasure in life, but spirit, like, yes. and spirit, meaning, again, sort of realizing your personality, uh, mm. and not in the modern sort of authenticity sense of, you know, who am I you know, being true to yourself, but in, in the sense that you know, all human beings have faculties that bring out our humanity mm. and we ought to develop these and we ought to have a, a, a government and laws which help us to develop our faculties, our mm. intellectual fa faculties, but especially our moral faculties, the moral sense that we should have to other people. And that was incredibly powerful. And, and yep. you'd find expressions of it in, in 
in school textbooks, in philosophical treatises, in, mm. in university magazine articles. Mm. And certainly it's something that, 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 that Menzies seemed to imbibe. Now, as you know, Simon, you're an intellectual historian, you know, it's, it's often very difficult to figure out exactly the causal links yeah. of ideas. You know, who exactly did Menzies get yeah. it from? What did he read? It, it's, it's very difficult to figure that out. But certainly he, his mind was formed in the Melbourne intellectual scene, which was powerfully influenced by yeah. this British idealism, which again, it starts to peter out after World War II. Mm. Uh, and it was very powerful in Sydney as well in Australia, up until John Anderson um, takes up a professorship at, in, at Sydney in about 1927, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and he takes Sydney in a very materialistic mm. uh, direction, which and materialism and idealism were kind of polar opposites. Um, and yeah, and, and so th certainly throughout Menzies writings in the, the 30s, 40s, 50s, there's this emphasis on spirit. Yeah, um, which ultimately, I think is what he was trying to recover in Australia. Uh, I mean, I think this, that's fascinating and I appreciate that, that because this strikes me as an area of Australian intellectual history that there could be more work done um, on, I, I think. I think it's really interesting. Um, I'm interested now to move to Menzies' Christianity mm. and the impact that Christianity had on his ideals. Um, Menzies was a, a Presbyterian. Uh, he, was a he was sort of a, Sc a Scottish uh, Presbyterian, I, I guess you would say as I guess most Presbyterians are technically. And um, uh, he, as you said, he, he often would recall lots of biblical tropes. Mm. Uh, he'd quote um, Jesus, he'd quote the Apostle Paul, and, and biblical ethics seemed to be very important to his politics. Mm. Um, what was the nature, that I guess, that you'd uncovered of his Christianity and the impact that that had on him? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. It's not necessarily an easy one to answer. Um, but certainly the ideals, the, the moral ideals and the language and the literature of Christianity had a massive impact on his mind and on just on the way he saw the world. It, it, it'd be hard to find a, a prime minister who drew on and quoted the Bible as much as Menzies, but more Bible and Christian ideas as mere sort of rhetorical um, tools. He, he did seem to sincerely believe that that civilization rested on Christian premises. Uh, he certainly believed democracy and, and the idea that we are all equal made no sense a, a, apart from the theological premises of everyone being created in the image of God. Now, of course, none of this was was unique for the time. I mean, that was a very, very common way of seeing things in the 40s and the 50s. And yeah. as you know, Simon, in the 40s and 50s, there's a kind of renaissance, a revival of Christian social That's thought right. all around the world. Yeah. And, and particularly, I suppose, after the horrors of World War II, um, there's this sense that we, you know, we, you know, we need to get back to basics. And that is that everyone is valuable. Everyone is created in God's image. And, and it sort of flowers with the United Nations um, you know, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, largely drafted by theologians. Um, and, and so, yeah, certainly Menzies' rhetoric and, and his sort of theoretical understanding of, of, of social duties, democracy, liberty mm. is strongly informed by Christianity and its sort of other person centered ethic. Now, in terms of, you know, what, what his kind of private or personal religiosity was, well, you know, as you well know, you know, you, you get a lot of, you know, evangelical Protestant admirers of, of, of Menzies who, who want to say that, well, you know, he was a, a genuine sort of heart changed Christian. Well, I mean, I, I have, I, I don't really know. Uh, all, all, all I know is that it's so, that, that sort of the Christian tradition and, and the Christian ideals meant a lot to him. And, and certainly when you read his diary from uh, the mid 1930s, when he went to England, uh, mm. all through the diary, um, he's visiting churches, uh, and one of his favorite pastimes was actually to visit churches, and, and he certainly also heard a lot of sermons, and yeah. he ha had very little good to say about the sermons. Yeah, usually. that was quite an amusing part of the book, actually. His yeah. uh, sermon critique was quite cutting at times. It was, um, and the, I think from memory, the only thing he actually said that he really liked in a sermon was when a minister said that you shouldn't take the Bible literally. He liked <laughs> yeah. that. And yeah. so probably Menzies himself was probably to some extent shaped by the liberalism yeah. that, that had, had pervaded the Presbyterian church by the, you know, by the 1930s. Yes. Um, so I, I guess I would probably 
suggests that Menzies Christianity, um, it, it, it was genuine, but it was, it was probably in some respects quite private. Mm. It was certainly not evangelical. He thought evangelicals were just a, a, a tad strange. And enthusiasts, a tad, right? Enthusiasts. That was connected to enthusiasm. That's right. He thought mm. they were a tad strange, but he also hated the lifelessness of, of a lot of the Anglican church. He didn't right. like that. And what he sort of longed for, and he says this in his diary, is sort of the, the, the evangelical sort of zeal, but with sort of the, in a sense, the intellectual depth of the Anglicans. And he just didn't think yeah. he could find that. Yeah. Um, I, I would describe Menzies' Christianity as, as quite aesthetic. He loved the aesthetics of Christianity and very moral. Beyond that, I don't know. I suspect he probably... Uh, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if he really believed the ancient creeds and things like that. And, and, mm. and I think the best way to think about it is, you know, Menzies in a very, in an essay he wrote called, I think something like on Englishness or something like that. He said, one of the things that marks the Englishman is that, yeah, you know, as opposed to the, the American, the Americans, the more, sort of the more strongly they feel about something, the more vocal they are about it. Right. Whereas he said with the Englishman, it's the opposite. The more yeah. strongly they feel about it, the more reserved they are about talking about it. And that may be the case with his Christianity. He was very reserved about talking about it. That may have been a hint on his part that it actually mm. did mean something to him. Yeah. Maybe that's wishful thinking on my part. Yeah, I yeah, don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, it's, it's, it, was, it was a fascinating aspect of the book because as you suggested before, there are certain evangelical, uh, inv ev politically interested evangelicals who would like to paint Menzies in a kind of hag hagiographical way yeah. as some kind of... Um, born again um christian um and he may well have been as you said but it's ambiguous uh yeah. if you look at the historical sources um so in this sense this book is not going to be a crowd pleaser for that kind of culture warrior group i mean mm. what do you think they're going to make of this aspect of I, look it's funny because i think i think yeah i think those who are looking for sort of a, a great christian or a great sort of evangelical statesmen uh, are going to be somewhat disappointed. Mm. And, and we know that Menzies actually rarely went to church. He, right. he wasn't a regular church goer. Now his daughter, Heather Henderson says that he was not religious and, and that, that needs to be taken seriously. Mm. But I, at the same time, and this is going to sound very, very arrogant. I, I don't think we should take it too seriously though, because mm -hmm. sometimes in order to understand a person's personality, you have to look at the big picture. Yeah. Um, and, and, and children, can sometimes be surprised to learn things about their parents from other people. Um, so I, I would stand by what I said earlier about the nature of religiosity, yeah. but yeah, th this book, um, I guess in some ways it, it's going to annoy those who want to see Menzies as a, as a kind of Turnbull-esque um, progressive. Yep. He, he, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense no. and, and and again what would it even mean i mean people sort of say what would how would menzies have voted on same-sex marriage how would he have voted on climate change well if we actually literally got menzies and put him in a time machine and brought him today he would have been horrified at the idea of same-sex yeah. marriage he wouldn't yeah. have even have thought it made sense to begin with yeah um but then morally speaking he would not have been in favor of it and then but someone might say oh yeah yeah but what if he sort of imbibed the ideals of today well then we're not talking about menzies yeah, exactly we're talking exactly. about someone else <laughs> so these questions so yeah it's it, it definitely uh, look i will say it definitely falls more on the side of it, it makes sense to describe Menzies as a conservative liberal. Um, Menzies didn't tend to describe himself as a conservative, although he, although he does at one point in his biography, he says about his childhood, even then I was instinctually a conservative. Yeah. Um, but you, we've got to remember that the term conservative is basically a dirty word in Australia. Yes. Uh, right up to the 1980s and, and the 1990s, n very few people were actually calling themselves conservatives. Yes. And, and so you could have people who, who would call themselves liberals and they'd be quoting Edmund Burke. They'd be yeah. talking about the importance of tradition, but they would not call themselves conservatives. It was, yeah. It's always yeah. kind of been a dirty word in Australia. So just because he didn't use the term to describe himself doesn't mean that the conservative instincts... Yeah. aren't with him. In fact, they are quite strongly. Yeah, I think you demonstrate that a number of times you point out the parallels between what Menzies thought and did um, in his policy and in his speeches and so on and, and a kind of Burkean, a Whiggish, a sort of Whiggish Burkean approach. And I found that quite compelling. Um, so that, no, I, that's, that's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating part of, I guess, looking back in time, isn't it? And looking back on other people in a different era, 
and trying to assess them um, with categories that we can't quite understand uh, mm. is a real challenge. I think that you, this has been a really helpful book in that regard for reassessing Menzies. Um, I guess one, one question I want to finish on, um, the, this book is much more careful and sympathetic to Menzies than many others would probably like, mm. but it's also quite critical. And in fact, as you point out in the final chapter, his legacy is limited in a number of important ways. Yeah. Um, he's sort of the final man of an era that died very quickly as the world yeah. changed <clears throat> in the seventies. Um, how would you assess his legacy and does it make him any less significant that his cultural aims, he ultimately failed in his cultural aims? What, what do you think? Yeah. Well, this is the thing. I mean, I, I have had a few people accuse Greg and, and myself of, of being sort of very sort of as not that you've sort of suggested this necessarily, but being like the book being very sympathetic to Menzies. I mean, when, when writing it, we had no intentions of being, of, of being sympathetic or mm. antipathetic uh, to Menzies. It really was just an exercise in, in intellectual history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I suppose, you know, the kind of, um, uh, the kind of reputation that Menzies has received over the years has basically just been sort of a, a walking anachronism, British yeah. to my bootstraps, pig iron Bob selling, selling iron to yeah. the Japanese. Um, it's actually very heavily influenced by Paul Keating in many ways, isn't it? The way that we think about Menzies, I think. Well, it's, it's, it's influenced. Mm. I mean, it, it, uh, the, the great influence of that particular tradition of thinking about Menzies goes all the way back to Donald Horn in, right. in his right. 1964 book, the, the, the forgotten, uh, the, um, the lucky country. Yeah. And he basically says, you know, M Menzies was yesterday's man. He's a walking anachronism. He was mm. you know, born during the period of Queen Victoria for goodness sakes. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then subsequent sort of, um, uh, political pundits and, 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 and labor prime ministers and labor historians just basically adopted that and ran with it. Right. I think maybe why the book appears very sympathetic to Menzies is because we, we don't focus on, on that part of him. We actually focus on Menzies as something of a serious thinker. Yeah. Um, and so because it's, it's not just basically trashing Menzies, which is yeah, a lot yeah. of what the discussion of Menzies has yeah. done over the last 50 years, uh, it probably appears sympathetic, but in actual fact, it's just, it's a fairly detached intellectual history. Yeah. That's how it strikes um, me as well, Steve, if I look at it, that it's yeah. actually going to the sources and looking at Menzies on his own terms and in his context. Uh, and that requires sympathy to an extent, right? To do well, that. you've got to know where the guy's coming from. And look, and we say in the book, and this is going to sound very unpopular, but we, we say he was not a deep thinker. He was not a great thinker. And I don't think he was a deep thinker. I don't think he was a great thinker. He was a great sort of imbiber of, of, of big ideas. And he had an inspiring way to, to express mm. them. But, uh, but yeah, in terms of his legacy, well, I mean, his legacy, his sort of cultural legacy was basically a failure. Mm. Um, but other aspects of his legacy have proven to be quite long, long lasting. So expanding and well funding the university sector mm. that lasted for a very long time. He was a great friend of the universities, uh, bringing in funding for denominational schools. That's basically become a settled issue in Australia. What Menzies did in the 1960s, yes. that cannot be undone. Australians like it. So he did that. Yes. Opening up trade to Asia. That's what yeah. Menzies was responsible for. He, he sort of kicked that off. Mm. And of course, just managing a booming economy after World War II. Mm -hmm. um, that's also sort of part of his legacy. So a lot of positive things, but, but for Menzies, I think the, the great thing that he wanted to do was to preserve that, that ethic of cultural Puritanism that he really thought characterized true Britishness, whether that's true or not is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But, but for, for Menzies, the, what he wanted to do was stop Australians from becoming too reliant on government, stop Australians from becoming too selfish, the more prosperous we became, stop Australians from becoming cultural Philistines by funding mm. the universities. And so he, he just wanted to make sure that there was a high culture in Australia and that there was a genuine sort of sense of, of in a sense, Christian fraternity in Australia. Yeah. And in that, I would say he failed. And so yeah. if that was the greatest thing that he wanted to do, mm. I would say that his greatest ambitions failed. And that's not going to, and it's not going to please the conservatives because no. they don't want to hear that, that Menzies' greatest ambitions failed. Right. But at the same time, it's not necessarily going to prove, uh, you know, um, um, please Menzies' critics because that's just another way of saying, well, Menzies failed in the sense that Australians have become selfish. They've become Philistines. Mm. They've become quite godless and they've basically become 
all of this uh, because of an over-reliance on government, because of secularization and, and things. So that's not going to make his, his critics all that happy either. Um, yeah. yeah. But uh, I mean, we didn't want to make anyone happy. We just wanted to do it, write a good book. So there we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. You're writing a scholarly book. I mean, what does it make him less significant that, they, that, that his cultural aims were not realized do you think well i suppose in a sense it does because if they were realized then by definition he'd have been more significant so in in a sense as a historical figure yeah um it, it must you know and, and as we say in the book when, when you read menzies right words now they just seem from another universe yeah. they seem quaint they see old old-fashioned old and that, in a sense, I would actually say that's a tremendous um, blight on modern Australia, that Menzies' emphasis on individuality, mm. um, pulling your weight, not having to rely on others, looking to yourself and your community as the first port of call for help. If that seems quaint in modern Australia, then, then so much the worse for modern Australia. But, but as I, we also point out in a footnote, Simon, mm. a, a lot of Whitlam's rhetoric is going to start to seem very quaint if, if sort of more sort of identity politics starts to continue. That's true. Um, so, yeah, th th culturally things are moving very, very quickly. Um, and yes, yeah, certainly, yeah, reading Menzies' writings, well, they may seem, they may be inspiring to his sympathizers, but really when I read them, they just seem like they were written um, for, another, for another world. And, you know, as the saying goes, the past is a foreign country. And, and certainly, in, in that respect, Menzies' thought just seems very foreign to today. Well, it's, it's a fascinating book, and I would encourage people to go out and get a copy and have a read. It's The Forgotten Menzies, The World Picture of Australia's Longest Serving Prime Minister. It's out with Melbourne University Press. Steve, it's a, good, a really great achievement, I think, a scholarly achievement, but also a significant uh, contribution to the conversation about Australian political and intellectual history. So congratulations to you and Greg you. on this very fine book. And uh, thanks for coming on the show. It was an honour, Simon. Great talking to you.